JPODs would like to thank Duke University and the Council on Competitiveness for letting us participate in this conference on manufacturing. In 1910, Edison gave an interview where he laid out the foundation for sustainable infrastructure. In that, he talked about electricity and sunshine looked a lot the same to him. They're spread out very thin. And what he had to do with electricity was accumulate it up enough and store it long enough that people could light a bunch of little lights. You got to remember in 1910, Edison had been working and working on electricity for about 40 years. But it would be another 40 years before electricity became a dominant aspect of American commerce. It takes a long time to shift infrastructure. We don't have that much time, and so what I'd like to lay out today is the possibility that we can retool urban transportation to be powered within a solar budget by 2020. And this will be a basis for retooling America's manufacturing base. To drive such a rapid change requires a 10x improvement in uh, productivity, either lower cost, higher profits, faster service, various things. But we must change the lifeblood of our economy from oil to ingenuity, from scarcity to abundance. To understand oil, here's a 60-year look at oil supply growth. Comparing that to GDP growth, you can see that they're very highly correlated. Basically, oil supply uh, fuels economic momentum, and we made oil the lifeblood of our economy. We needed to find a metric for evaluating this shift from oil to ingenuity, and what we came up with is that life requires energy and disposable income gives us flexibility to do the things that we would like in our life. So disposable energy is disposable income's ability to buy energy. And it is a good indicator of progress, and it is a leading indicator of crises. In our current situation, in 2002, most families could afford both their commute and their mortgage when gas was $1.45 a gallon. By 2006, gas prices had increased to 296 and more and more families were forced to choose between paying for their commute and paying for their mortgage. By 2008, foreclosures collapsed the banking system, and today homeowners have lost about $13 trillion in economic value. In Oil was made the lifeblood of our economy in the mobilization to fight World War I. We monopolized communications under AT&T and socialized power and transportation infrastructures as natural monopolies. The great innovations of Ford, Edison, Bell, and the Wright brothers were institutionalized. The unintended consequence of the fact that institutions strive for consistency above all else is that we got a century rotary telephones, ever more dependence on the central grid, and we still have the gas mileage of the Model T. Institutions will study and even can invent things like the internet and cell phones, but they cannot commercialize them. Innovations like that are disruptive. In 1984, we shifted back to a free market in communications. And in a free market, competitors are forced to compete for customers by differentiating instead of striving for consistency. So some strive for better service, some lower cost, some tinker with innovations. And occasionally those innovations hit a 10x shift and change the world. So about 20 years after the invention of the cell phones and the internet, they commercialized into creating millions of jobs, vast innovation, and better service at lower cost. In 1869, we saw disruptive innovations in transportation. In 1865, it cost $1,000 to buy a ticket from New York to San Francisco. Just four years later, that cost had dropped to $67. The transcontinental railroads shifted American infrastructure, and railroads became the circulatory system for the, for the Industrial Revolution and they were the catalyst for changing the energy systems from biofuels to fossil fuels. They changed hay and wood to coal and oil. 
They created an incredible internal demand which allowed the fossil fuel industries to scale and they reduced the cost to transport. We can repeat the success of railroads by combining ultralight railroads with computer networks to make a physical version of the internet that operates not on the same plane as congestion and safety problems of automobiles. Solar collectors over the top of the rails gather 5 to 30,000 vehicle miles of power per mile of rail per day, creating a large stable market for solar collectors at the same time of making the network, the transportation network, durable against blackouts. By suspending the vehicles below the rail, we take out the mass of the suspension system. So 500 pound to 600 pound vehicles can haul 1200 pound payloads nonstop from origin to destination. And cargoes can be people, cargo, garbage. So we're building a circulatory system for an economic community. Because this is ultralight technologies, we can deploy it over broken heavy infrastructure to reduce the cost of recovering from natural disasters by about 90%. Looking at this in disposable energy, the building of this creates massive numbers of jobs. In addition, it gives us a 10x efficiency gain and families spend about $10,300 a year on transportation. When networks hit about 70% density, that will be cut in half, similar to the way cell phone bills have dropped in half, and families will have an extra $5,000 of disposable income. This is a huge gain in disposable energy. Now, the barrier to this is that central planners don't know how to grant rights of way. So we have not been able to build across a street. Here's solar collectors designed to go over J-Pod's rails by, designed by Swenson Solar, but they're stuck shading a parking lot. One of, the only good aspect about not being able to build is it forced us to really examine the nature of solar energy and solar electricity. And what we came to a conclusion is that nature's low work solution for storing distributing solar energy is not electricity, it is chemistry. Chemistry such as food, wood, coal, oil, natural gas. And so what we looked at is we can just move the energy that we collect on our solar collectors a short distance to electrolyze water. So you get separated into hydrogen and oxygen. You take the hydrogen, which is very difficult to manage, and you can use it. Or you can combine it with carbon dioxide, run it over a catalyst, and you end up with methane. So T. Boone Pickens is right that natural gas is the solution for the future. And we can use fossil natural gas as a bridge fuel. But long term, we can use synthetic natural gas to accomplish what Edison viewed as very practical, that we should be able to store unlimited amounts of energy gathered locally, and that energy ought to be incredibly inexpensive. One of the curious things about this is how scalable this natural approach is. So J-Pods are about a megawatt per mile system. This little picture of this unit at the top is a two watt. They can be scaled from the size that somebody might take camping to what you might use at your house. So we view this as the creation of the personal energy server market that will be very similar to personal computers in that everybody will have one. And in the future, you'll look at a city and it will look very much like a forest where there's personal energy collectors everywhere. And they're all tied together by this natural distribution of gas. The unit on the right is a specialty unit that little solar collector gathers enough energy every day to charge cell phones and to light a light every night. So in competing with places where there's kerosene lamps or after a disaster, this is how you can have lights and communications regardless of the capacity of the grid. Now, we need to face the Stockdale Paradox, which is unwavering faith that we will prevail while facing the most brutal facts of our current reality. This was laid out in Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. This is what the Arctic looks like for most of all of human history and for the three years that I spent as an Arctic light infantryman up in Alaska. This was 79's ice cap. 
By 2003, that had shrunk dramatically. 2007 was even worse. Nothing moves on this scale unless titanic forces are being unleashed. And because we're socializing the cost of carbon, we don't really measure what, the, what it is. But I tend to look at this thing the way Edison did. It's not a scientific question. It is a moral question that we are burning wood and coal or we're burning gas and oil like squatters burn the front fence. I do understand oil and logistics. So here's a 90-year look at American oil production. We find it. We put in place the logistics and the infrastructures to extract it. We hit a maximum rate at which we can flush oil out of rocks. It peaks or plateaus and then diminishes. In 1970, U.S. domestic oil production peaked. Since 1970, eight presidents have declared imported oil a threat to national security, an enemy of the Constitution. Unfortunately, in this same 90-year period of time, because central planners and institutions strive for consistency above all other objectives, the highway was made the answer to everything. We lost thousands of miles of railroads, countless windmills, family gardens, and our self-reliance. Since 1970, oil imports have increased from 20% to 60%, creating oil's potato famine potential of a monolithic dependence on a source of energy 60% outside our control. Because so much of oil's costs are not capitalized, and because this is a government monopoly, costs that could not be capitalized into a price of a gallon of gas were socialized into the national debt. And you can see the incredible correlation between debt and oil import growth. This created an economic and ecological cul-de-sac. We have a very short period of time to solve this. In 2010, in the Joint Operating Environment, the Joint Forces Command warned all U.S. military commands to expect zero spare capacity by 2012 and 10 million barrels a day short by 2015. The International Energy Agency, which we are a signator to and have pledged the Strategic Petroleum Reserve to support, notes this also in the World Energy Outlook in 2010, this catastrophic drop in conventional crude, that's the blue area. But they show that demand will meet supply, or supply will meet demand, but it's being filled in by oil fields yet to be found and oil fields yet to be developed. So as long as we can eat food yet to be grown, we're going to do just perfectly fine. Now, you take all U.S. oil production and put it on a 200-year curve and all add all the worlds to it, and you find that we peaked six years ago at 74 million barrels a day. Now, you'll hear numbers like 86 million, but we only count energy that is affordable. There's all kinds of energy out there that exceed $80 a barrel or $30 a barrel, which is really what we built our economy on. So our primary concern is with disposable energy. And in the next 20 years, we're going to lose about 85% of our disposable energy. So we're faced with a choice. We can either reduce energy required per passenger mile 80%, or nature will reduce the number of passengers 80%. I don't think we have an energy problem. Because as I look at it, we're going back to the energy my parents had when they became parents. And I think they did pretty well. I think we have a lot at stake. Here's my daughter, Tara, when she was little. Here she is in the upper left-hand side of this picture, operating a machining center, building an invention that she created. We can teach our children to use the tools of invention. We can teach them how to manufacture the things that they will need to build. We can actually power our society within a solar budget, and we can do it by 2020. Thank you very much for your time today.